So then, how about this projector? The projector was some mathematical operation that for any solution, for any function in the original space, H10, gives us a function in our finite element approximation space. Yeah, so in the mapping terminology that we introduced in one of the earlier lectures, we then say that P is some mapping that goes from V, our infinite dimensional space, so, so far we've often said this is going to be H10, uh, to our finite element approximation space VH. And again, we had the, the, the requirements that this is a linear operation and an idempotent operation. And so P of U1 plus U2 is equal to P of U1 plus P of U2. And idempotent means P, P is equal to P. So this projector gave us a choice, and the choice was that we wanna uh, that we get to pick what we find to be a good solution for any function in U, in, in H10. Now, uh, one example that I already kind of smuggled in there in one of my in one of the previous videos here was the idea of trying to minimize uh, the least squares error. Often we use the 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 the, the square norm, the L2 norm, as our error measure. And apparently we say that a low L2, uh, L2 error means a good solution. So how about we define our projector as that function with the smallest possible L2 norm error, or L2 error. So that's what we call the L2 projector. We're gonna say that if we take the projection of some function u, then that is going to be the, the, the function, so the argument in the solution uh in our finite dimensional approximation space vh, such that it, it produces the infimum, the minimum of u minus uh. And I'll also even square this, although that doesn't have any difference. So this is a linear operation, uh, this is an idempotent operation, so this would be a, a, a proper uh, projector. So let me write out this norm, so this is going to be the argument of the infimum of uh in vh of u minus uh square, yeah, that's it. So you could write this out further, you could actually do uh, a Gateau derivative on this, and then you can actually more clearly see that it is a linear operator. Uh, you can already see from right here that this is in fact an idempotent operator, uh, because if u is actually in vh, well then naturally the function uh, uh, that is the best approximation to that is going to be equal to u, and that's precisely what the idempotency was, right? That if we perform p on any uh, any function in the core scale space, then that gives us uh, precisely that function. So it's linear and idempotent. And naively, we could say, well, that's actually a very good choice because, well, again, we're using this error very often as, a, as, a, as, a, as an error measure, and then we say that low L2 errors are, are good solutions. Now, it turns out, however, that for fluid mechanics problems, uh, this is actually not a very good idea. For so for for fluid mechanics, this is not such a good idea, and that is because in fluid mechanics we often have certain characteristics in our in our function in our solutions, uh, and specifically characteristics in the form of them. Um, sharp layers. So we got boundary layers, as we've seen in the advection and advection diffusion equation, and in Navier-Stokes equation, and for hyperbolic or something that tends towards a hyperbolic problem, we also get sharp layers as shocks, uh, the extreme limit being the Euler equation, where we saw for the DG methods that you get tons of shocks all over the place. So in general, in fluid mechanics, we, we get these sharp layers, and if we have a certain sharp layer in our solution field, so let me 
let me write some some h10 function right so a function that is an h1 so it has to be continuous so let me write this down it's not a complete shock right so it's still continuous and i have well a mesh defined by a certain set of nodes here And if I were now to take the projection, so this is going to be U, and if I were now to take the projection of U, according to this definition of what we find to be an optimal solution in this approximation space, uh, then you would get something that, that looks more like... this. Uh, okay, well, that's kind of difficult to, <laughs> to draw these things exactly on the... There we go. So you get something like this. You get huge oscillations. This kind of has to do with the Gibbs phenomena that you, you might be familiar with for the uh, Fourier transforms. And um, so this is a general property of the L2 projector that if there are sharp layers, then you get oscillations. So oscillations near sharp layers. And again, since in fluid mechanics we, we tend to have these sharp layers in our solutions, it's not a, a very uh, suitable way of defining a good solution. Okay, so that one is off the table. Let's try something else. Let's try Galerkin, op uh, or, uh, op Galerkin optimality. So the L2 was our first choice. The second one is going to be Galerkin optimality. Now, optimality, that, that also sounds good, right? An optimal solution. So we're going to define our optimal solution, P of U, UH, as the function such that the bilinear form of our problem, so this sort of encodes the physics already in our definition of a good solution, of the original function minus our approximation tested against any possible function in the core scale space that that is going to be equal to zero. So somehow we're, we're encoding the physics into our definition of our projector. Uh, again, we can show that this is uh, for certain cases at least. So I have to be a little bit careful here. This is uh, this is either potent and this is a. Uh, um, Actually, I think as long as the bilinear form, the, the formulation is well defined, you can show that this is an idempotent operator and due to, well, it's a bilinear form, so it's also going to be a linear operator. So when is this a good idea? Now, I can already tell you for fluid mechanics, this is again not a good idea. But suppose that if bi the bilinear form actually encodes an internal energy. So if B dot comma dot represents an internal energy then this definition of a projector this definition of our best approximation uh gives us then this gives us the optimal solution or optimal approximation in what we call the energy norm and that's something you may have heard of before the energy norm because that's something uh, that relates very strongly to well the origins of finite element methods solar mechanics so this is precisely something that we see with solid mechanics. In solid mechanics, our bilinear forms do represent internal energies, and Galerkin optimality then corresponds to finding the approximation that is optimal in this energy norm. There is no approximation uh, that is a better approximation to the true solution in terms of the internal energy. So now I can also actually kind of illustrate how we're going to end up using this projector in our finite element formulation. So 
if we take a look at our variational multiscale formulation and we take a look at what's going to be our finite element formulation, so this line, and we take a closer look at the definition of Galerkin optimality, then we see that this is actually saying that b of u prime vh is equal to zero for all vh in vh. Now u minus uh, well that's u prime. And again, going back to the variational multiscale formation, well that is precisely this term here. So what we can do is, if we choose, and again this is a choice, if we choose our projected to be the, the operation that gives us the, the optimal solution in the energy norm, energy norm according to this, this Galerkin op optimality, uh, then this projector immediately kills or cancels all the fine scale terms in the variational multiscale formulation. So again, this was star, this was double star. So with that conclusion, or with that, that statement here, we can conclude that the finite element formulation automatically becomes So that was star, right? Becomes nothing other than our standard finite element method, right? So this variational multiscale formulation, which had a fine scale term in here, with this choice of optimality, that fine scale uh, terms actually are are going to be zero. The influence of the fine scales onto the core scales are zero, and we get our standard bubnov galerkin galerkin finite element formulation. And this is why uh, we get, we have the property that our finite element approximations to linear elasticity equations are optimal in the energy norm. So this is a result that we often state, in my opinion, sort of inversely. Uh, often we start off with the bubnov galerkin approximation to the weak statement, and then uh, as if it's a coincidence, we say, well, Look at this, uh, we end up with a solution that's that's optimal in the energy norm. Whereas I would say, well, you have to state this the other way around. You have to state this coming from a weak formulation. You have to decompose this because certainly jumping to approximation spaces, in my mind, doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, but rather we have to decompose these spaces partly into approximation space and partly into the fine scale space. And only for certain choices of projector uh, do we get then the bubnov galerkin uh, formulation? And the choice of projector is the Galerkin optimality. And this choice of projector, the choice of the Galerkin optim optimality projector, only makes sense uh, if this statement is a good definition of our, uh, of our approximation, and specifically that is if the B represents an internal energy, and that is what we have for solar mechanics. Okay. Now, for fluid mechanics, we do not have the property that B represents an internal energy, and hence this Galerkin optimality uh, produces solutions that fly all over the place uh, and are certainly not what we would typically say uh, to be optimal. Right? So again, not a good choice uh, for fluid mechanics. Great choice for solid mechanics, but not a good choice for fluid mechanics. So then, finally getting to the point here, the thing that we do typically suggest as a projector in the variational multiscale uh, framework is the H10 projector. So this is an energy or an error minim minimizer, but not the L2 error, but, error, but rather the H10 error. And we define that as well, P of U is going to be the again the, the argument that minimizes arc inf looking for all possible solutions in the space, in our approximation space, well, the minimum of the, the norm of u minus uh, or what norm? The h10 norm. And the h10 norm is, is actually not quite the same as the h1 norm. There's a slight difference. 
And the difference is that in the H10 case, we actually can remove the L2 part of the H1 norm. Uh, there's very clear reasons for why that is, but I'm not going to go into that. I'll just state this as a fact here. The uh, H10 norm is this statement, that the gradients are minimized. The error in the gradients is minimized. So this is the least squares uh, of the gradients. Yeah, so in contrast to the, the L2 projector, we're not taking the least squares of the function, but with its gradients. So what does that look like? Um, so let's take again the example of the shock, which was a very difficult problem to look at, to, to consider for the L2 projector. And sorry, I didn't want to draw that as a pure shock. Right? So we said still function H1 is still continuous. So we do something like this. And if I have a very coarse mesh here, then this being U, our projection is actually going to be nodally exact. This is going to be P of U. Now you can also prove why that is. It's also not something that we're going to go into here. I just want to illustrate what we might expect or what we might find to be a good projector. And in a, uh, the same thing holds for a more difficult true solution. If, if this is our true solution, um, then I also the projection of that would be like a nodally exact solution. So we get a nodally exact solution. Now that is in 1D, in uh, multi-D that, that's no longer true, uh, but you still get very s regular solutions uh, to these, uh, uh, to these um, very regular approximations to the true solutions. And also for boundary layers and for shocks, they tend to, to have a very nice effect in the sense that the true projector doesn't quite overshoot and undershoot. Yeah, okay, and I think the rest that I have in my notes here is something that I'll talk about later. Um, so naturally, this would be a nice, uh, a nice projector to use and a, a good way of defining our, our, um, our, our best approximation to any function u in our approximation space. It also provides a quite clean mathematical uh, operator here, uh, the, inf the, the minimum error in the H10 norm. Um, so that's that's a clean definition. Again, you can prove that this is linear and idempotent. And uh, just looking at it, we, we can, I think, all agree that this is a, a solution that we would be happy with to find, especially compared to the solutions that we tend to find for these, uh, these shock type problems. Okay, so uh, I hope that this kind of uh, answered the question of, of what kind of operators are we looking for when we're talking about projectors. Um, you saw three different cases that all count as projectors and, and you would, in principle, be free to choose any one of them. Uh, but naturally, uh, we were trying to answer also the question of, of what is a good uh, approximation uh, to, to, our, to our, our problems. And, and that is not always what we might expect it to be, right? In this case of the minimizing the, um, the, the L2 error, that, that sounds like a good idea, but it ends up not being very effective. And I also hope that this was insightful. Uh, this is, I don't think, something that you'll find in many textbooks, um, but this is my interpretation of, of things uh, from a variational multiscale perspective, which is actually what I, I focus on my own research. Uh, but I, I find this to be a very insightful way of looking at, uh, at fine temperature methods in general, uh, and, and also being able to both uh, look at fluid mechanics, but also solid mechanics from the same perspective, and then coming to the conclusions. Well, solid mechanics just happens to be that particular case where the Glurkin optimality that is apparently implicit in Bubnov Glurkin's formulation is a good projector. Now, in, the, in, the, in the, the subsequent videos, we're going to exclusively focus on this H10 projector. And then we find that our finite elements in, uh, formulations tend to simplify a little bit, and also that our fine scales are moderately easy to compute, or at least to, to approximate, and we get good approximations. And then we see how that relates to turbulence models and stabilized methods. Okay, thank you for your attention.